I'm going to show you how to turn procrastination into perseverance. And if you do what I suggest, the process will be virtually painless. I'm going to be very specific about how you can do this. I refer to a negative vision of the future as a mental tool for inactivity. If you've been using that tool, I'm going to ask you to toss it aside and start using two other very powerful principles that foster productivity and perseverance instead of passivity and procrastination. The first principle is break it down. No matter what you're trying to accomplish, whether it's writing a book or climbing a mountain or painting a house, the key to achievement is your ability to break down the task into manageable pieces and knock them off one at a time. Focus on accomplishing what's right in front of you at this moment and ignore what's off in the distance someplace. Substitute real-time positive thinking for negative future visualization. That's the first all-important technique for bringing an end to procrastination. Suppose I were to ask you if you could write a 400-page novel. If you're like most people, that would be an impossible task. As soon as I ask you that question, a picture appears in your mind of a big fat book lying on a coffee table, hundreds and hundreds of words covering every page. Yes, somebody must have written the book that you see in your mind's eye, but that person surely wasn't you. But suppose I ask you a different question. Suppose I ask if you can write a page and a quarter a day for one year. Do you think you could do it? Now the task is starting to seem more manageable. We're breaking down the 400-page book into bite-sized pieces. But even so, I suspect many people would still find the prospect intimidating. Do you see why? Writing a page and a quarter may not seem so bad, but you're being asked to look ahead one whole year. When people start to look that far ahead, many of them automatically go into a negative mode. So let me formulate the idea of writing a book in yet another way. Let me break it down even more. Suppose I were to ask you, can you fill up a page and a quarter with words, not for a year, not for a month, not even for a week, but just today? Don't look any further ahead than that. I believe most people would confidently declare that they could accomplish that. And of course, these would be the same people who feel totally incapable of writing a whole book. Then if I said the same thing to those people tomorrow, if I told them, I don't want you to look back, I don't want you to look ahead, I just want you to fill up a page and a quarter this day, do you think you can do it? One day at a time, you've probably heard that phrase, that's what we're doing here. We're breaking the time required for a major task down into one-day segments, and we're breaking the work involved in writing a 400-page book down into page and a quarter increments. Keep this up for one year, and you'll write the book. Discipline yourself to look neither forward nor backward, and you can accomplish things you never thought you could possibly do. One of the beauties of this technique is the fact that you can really take it to the extremes if you have to, if writing a page and a quarter during one day still seems too much for you. Break it down even more. Try to write three sentences in the next hour. Don't look any further ahead than that. Come up with a way of looking at the task that finally seems manageable. Then all you have to do is persevere. Procrastination won't be a problem because the task is now so small that fear won't kick in. And it all begins with those three words, break it down. My second technique for defeating procrastination is also only three words long. The three words are, write it down. We've seen how important writing is to goal setting the writing you'll do for beating procrastination is very similar. But instead of focusing on the future, you're now going to be writing about the present, just as you experience it every day. 
Instead of describing the things that you want to do or the places you want to go, you're going to describe what you actually do with your time, and you're going to keep a written record of the places you actually go. In other words, you're going to keep a diary of your activities, and you're going to be amazed by the distractions, detours, and downright wastes of time that you come up with during the course of a day. All of these get in the way of achieving your goals. For many people, it's almost like they planned it that way, and maybe at some unconscious level, they did. The great thing about keeping a time diary is that it brings all this out in the open. It forces you to see what you're actually doing and what you're not doing. The time diary doesn't have to be anything elaborate. Just buy a little spiral notebook that you can easily carry in your pocket. When you go to lunch, when you drive across town, when you go to the dry cleaners, when you spend some time shooting the breeze at the copy machine, make a quick note of the time you began the activity and the time it ended. Try to make this notation as soon as possible. But if it's inconvenient to do it immediately, you can do it later. But you should make an entry in your time diary at least once every 30 minutes. And you should keep this up for at least a week. What else do you have to do to gain the benefits of this extremely powerful productivity technique? Nothing. You don't have to do anything else at all. It's just a process for making yourself aware of how you actually spend your time. You will naturally and effortlessly begin to reorganize your life. Perhaps that seems like too much to believe, but it's true. When you're forced to write down the fact that you hung out at the coffee machine for 15 minutes today, you'll think twice about doing that again tomorrow. When you've got to put it in writing that you worked on an important project for 30 minutes today and then took a break to read the newspaper, you'll persevere a little longer on the project tomorrow and forget about the newspaper. Just try keeping a time diary for one week and you'll see how it can revolutionize your ability to focus and achieve your goals. Break it down, write it down. Very easy to understand, very straightforward. But these are powerful and effective productivity techniques. This is how you put an end to procrastination. This is how you get yourself started. But how do you keep going? How do you keep your motivation consistently high? How do you learn to persevere when the novelty is worn off and you're still some distance from your goal? We'll talk about that in a moment. The Irish poet William Butler Yeats once wrote a poem describing some of the unfortunate characteristics of the modern world. One of the things Yeats noticed was the fact that bad people seem to have the most energy, while good people become discouraged and doubtful of their own abilities. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are filled with a passionate intensity. Those are the words Yeats used. And it's true that we can look around the world and see all sorts of things happening that we might wish were not happening. And there are people working very hard to make those things happen for reasons that we might not admire. And when we see that, it's easy to start saying, what's the use? What hope do I really have? Why don't I just give up on all the things I've been trying to accomplish and just start taking it easy? Even people of strong character feel that way sometimes. All of us have moments like that. That's when perseverance gets really, really tough. What's the answer? Well, you recall that during our discussion of goal setting, I asked you to list five categories for your long-term goals. What do you want to do? What do you want to be? What do you want to see? What do you want to have? Where do you want to go? Now I want you to add another one. With whom do you want to share? In other words, who are you working for besides yourself? In the first five categories, you were asked to focus exclusively on your own aspirations and why they were important to you. But now I want you to think in terms of other people. Who is depending on you? 
Who will benefit if you persevere and succeed? Who will suffer if you give up and stop trying? Who can you reach out to and help once you've achieved your goals? Write down answers to these questions just like you wrote answers for the other categories. For many people, the answers will appear quite readily. If you have a family, your spouse and your children are depending on you. Perhaps even your parents are depending on you now if they're elderly and require some care. But even if you're a single person or just starting out in your career, you can think of reasons to persevere and succeed that go beyond your personal needs. Maybe you would like to share some of your financial success with the schools that educated you or with the religious institutions that gave you spiritual guidance or with a hospital that helped to heal you on some occasion. This sharing doesn't have to be limited to money either. If your work has given you certain skills, you can share your time and your abilities. You can and you should. But even this isn't putting it strongly enough. It isn't just that you'll do better if you feel you're working for others in addition to yourself. You absolutely must find reasons outside yourself to persevere if you want to keep going when the going gets tough. Hemingway wrote, A man alone hasn't got a chance. And that doesn't mean only that you need people to help you in life. It means also that you need people you can help. You need people who can become the real reasons for perseverance above and beyond your material possessions or your financial success. What's in it for me can only take you so far. What's in it for somebody besides me can take you as far as you need to go. In the last days of World War II, the American cruiser Indianapolis was sunk by an enemy submarine. This was one of the most tragic incidents of the war for American forces, in which hundreds of men lost their lives. Many who made it through the initial attack had to spend days and nights in the water before rescuers arrived. The experience of trying to stay alive in the water was so overwhelming that many people simply gave up. In fact, the survivors reported later that virtually everyone wanted to give up at one time or another. But whenever someone wanted to quit trying, the others would talk to him about the people back home who needed him who were depending on him to survive. And if there was no one who was depending on him right then, they would talk about people in the future who would someday be needing him, people he hadn't met yet, people who hadn't even been born yet. They conjured up all sorts of reasons above and beyond simply surviving. This motivation beyond the self was the only motivation that was strong enough. And what was true in an extreme sense for those men in wartime is also true in all our lives, no matter what we're trying to accomplish. 